it's not a wonderful life for President Trump. In fact, the past several weeks have been nothing short of a nightmare for him. There's the government shutdown that's sending hundreds of thousands of people home without pay just before the holidays. There have been multiple resignations at the highest levels of his cabinet. Of course, Trump's fending off investigations of nearly every entity with his name on it. There were numerous foreign policy blunders and a sudden troop withdrawal that sent experienced advisors heading for the exits. Then there's a slowing stock market and fears of a recession looming on the horizon. This movie isn't Capra, it's Coppola. Arguably the most significant blow to the Trump presidency came on Thursday with the abrupt announcement that Defense Secretary Jim Mattis will be leaving his post in February. Of course, Mattis's departure follow, follows that of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, who left in disgrace just last week, and before that, Attorney General Jeff Sessions firing in November. But the Secretary of Defense's protest resignation left zero ambiguity as to why he was leaving. It was precipitated by the president's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from Syria and Afghanistan, a move that put Trump at odds not only with Secretary Mattis, but with all of his foreign policy advisors, another of whom, Brett McGurk, resigned last night. It's put him on the other side of Republicans and Democrats. When your only supporters on foreign policy are Rand Paul and Vladimir Putin, you know you're probably doing it wrong. To cap it all off, the stock market, the president's favorite barometer for the nation's economic health, well, it took a nosedive on Friday, with the Dow Jones having its worst week since the financial crisis of 2008. The sudden market volatility is in part a result of uncertainty created by the president's trade policies, as well as his inability to play political chess with Democrats and avoid a shutdown. Of course, the president is blaming the market downturn on the Federal Reserve's raising of interest rates and Trump has reportedly begun polling advisors on whether or not he has the legal authority to fire Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Finally, Trump's reportedly lashing out at his hand-picked acting attorney general, Matt Whitaker, for failing to prevent prosecutors in the Southern District of New York from implicating him in a hush money scheme. Oh boy. A report that's so alarming. On any other week, that information alone would suck the oxygen right out of the news cycle. But this isn't any other week. It's, as one top House Republican told CNN, the week the wheels may be coming off. Okay, here's the deal. Something is rotten in the state of Trump's presidency. It stinks, it reeks, it's decomposing before our very eyes. Trump, his supporters and Republicans who gave him cover, can no longer pretend that this is a healthy administration. We are watching it fall apart. Now, for Trump opponents, this might seem like validation for all the warnings and concern they expressed, warnings that Trump didn't know enough, didn't listen enough, frankly, didn't care enough to do this very hard job. But none of this is good news. None of this is good for you, the American people. Think of it this way. If America were a business and the CEO was facing a dozen criminal and ethics investigations, Multiple members of his inner circle had gone to jail. He was making rash decisions, rash decisions that prompted his top advisors to quit in protest. And the company had to temporarily shut down over failed internal business negotiations. What would happen? Investors would pull out, of course. Other companies might end their partnerships. Consumers would lose faith in the company. Shares would plummet. The board of directors might even consider replacing the embattled CEO, right? Well, for all his business acumen, it turns out Trump is a terrible CEO of a truly great company. A company he isn't making great again, but rather he's running into the ground. Okay, for some perspective from Washington, D.C., let me bring in Republican Congressman from Illinois, Adam Kinzinger. Uh, Congressman, let's start with the shutdown. Is there any way you think this thing gets hashed out in the next few days, or are we in it for a long stay, as the president says. I, you know, I don't know. It's like a bad episode of General Hospital where, you know, the, the plot's the same over and over, but we just can't look away and we do it all over and over again. So yeah. I, uh, you know, I look at this and go, president wants five billion. Probably what ends up happening is mm -hmm. he gets a little less than that. I, I think the president deserves the money for the wall, honestly. Like he ran on this. Uh, yeah. It's pretty well supported and we should do it. But 
uh, shutting down the government, especially when you have the Democrats coming in January 3rd. Uh -huh. uh, that's a time certain where now they have a seat in the House. So um, I don't think it gets resolved anytime in the very near future, but I think we may end up getting to something hopefully by the time the new Congress comes in. It's 25% yeah. of government. It's not the entire government, but it's no way to do business. So do you think that Trump was outplayed, outmaneuvered by Democrats on, on the wall in the shutdown? Not necessarily. I mean, you know, when you have an inflexible Democratic Party that says we're just simply not going to do anything that's called wall. And on <laughs> our side, we're like, we want to do something called wall. It's what the president ran on. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of bl I don't know if there's blame everywhere, but that's it's a really bad part of how this negotiates. And so, you know, the president for two years has signed spending bills that didn't have a lot of wall money in it. And it really kind of came to a head now. So I don't yeah. like it. I think it sends a bad message. Obviously, yeah. over the holidays, it makes people uncomfortable, especially. Mm -hmm. But I think we get through it like we always do somehow. So are you alarmed by the chaos inside this administration, the, the ethics violations, the investigations, the resignations, the snap policy decisions? Does that alarm you? Yeah, I mean, it's these investigations, nobody likes to see them. It's, it's, it, and you made a really good point. If this was President Obama, I wouldn't be celebrating any of this. This is a great country that right. we have to have two healthy parties and a very healthy administration. Uh, where I'm especially concerned is the area of Syria, the potential yeah. decision on Afghanistan, you know, really waking up one day and echoing Rand Paul's foreign policy view, which I got to tell you, 2% of the country votes libertarian in any given you know, presidential cycle because their foreign policy views are way out of the mainstream. And this is a page right yeah. out of Rand Paul's book. And, and you've seen that when all of the administration officials over the last few weeks and months have said, we're gonna be in Syria for a while because there's so many reasons to be there. And like that, it changes. It's, it's very concerning. Yeah. And we're, we're going to talk more about Syria later in the show, but I, I do want to talk to you about it um, because you and I have talked about Syria a lot. And I know how important you think it, it is that we that we finish that fight uh, if we can. Do you have plans to talk to the president about that or have you spoken to the president about Syria? Yeah, I had uh, actually quite a uh, in-depth conversation with the president, and you know I don't want to reveal all the details of that because sure. I think there's it's important to be able to have that trust to talk openly. Uh, he was very open. I was very open. It was respectful. I believe uh -huh. he really believes he's doing the right thing, uh, but I vehemently disagree with what he's doing. You know, the the point is we have a base, for instance, in Tamf. Uh, only 200 people are there, but it is blocking Iran from being able to supply weapons to the enemies of Israel. We have mm -hmm. basically 30% of Syria under the U.S. and its allies' protection for a relatively low involvement, 2,200 mostly advisors. To leave that position takes us away from the negotiating table to end this. A humanitarian crisis is impending right. when they attack Idlib, which will happen. Right. Uh, it's a mess all around, not to mention it's a recruiting boon for ISIS. Uh, all of that and more. So what did you make of James Mattis uh, retiring? What did you make of his resignation letter? It was pretty, pretty scathing. Yeah, it was a professional and scathing letter. I, th I think it was right for him to do. He obviously had very intense policy disagreements with the president. The president, agree with him or disagree, probably deserves somebody in that position that, that is, can advise him with his trust. But look, Mattis knew what was important. He knew the importance of this position in Syria. He knew the importance of continuing to press the fight in Afghanistan. We don't choose whether to fight terrorists. We just choose where to fight terrorists. And so I think mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Mattis did the honorable thing by stepping down. Congressman Kinzinger, thanks so much. Have a merry Christmas at home with your friends you and too. family.